Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining tonight. Um, we're here for the program Learning from Global South Union's Student Voices on Climate Action and Just Energy Transition. Um, tonight's program is a collaboration between the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, also known as SLU, uh, and Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, also known as 2ED. Uh, so uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Irene Hongping Shen, and I'm the organizer and outreach coordinator with 2ED. 2ED works in partnership with CUNY SLU, and we're based in SLU's International Program for Labor, Climate, and Environment. <clears throat> I first want to thank Paula Finn, Director of Public Engagement and Editor of New Labor Forum, a national journal of the School of Labor and Urban Studies. We're here tonight because Paula had an idea a year ago about starting a SLU travel scholarship in conjunction with 2ED's work. So together with Gladys Palma de Schreinemakers, the school's Associate Dean of Academic Affairs, we were able to make it a reality last fall for the first ever SLU travel scholarship. Um, the scholarship was open to graduate level students in degree and certificate programs. So tonight we're gonna to hear from two, um, the two inaugural recipients of the scholarship, Anna Kazradzi and Andrew Pizzullo, both graduate students in SLU's labor studies program. We're also gonna hear from Lala Penaranda, a SLU alumni who now works with TUED as our communications and Latin America coordinator. So I think some of you might be newer to TUED and I'll give you a little background. Um, 2ED is a global network of unions, and we actually hit 100 unions last week um, in the network. So, woohoo! Um, so, 100 unions from 37 countries. And we're the largest international trade union project working specifically on uh, climate change and energy policy. We do both research uh, and work with unions on the ground on issues of energy and climate policy with a specific focus on the public ownership and democratic control of the energy sector. We have a very clear position on the question of ownership of energy. Our analysis shows that the privatization of energy and neoliberal energy policies have been completely ineffective in meeting climate targets. We believe that a full reclaiming of the energy sector into public ownership is necessary to decarbonize and meet climate targets. So in other words, we are proposing that energy not be a for-profit sector, but that electricity be a public good delivered as a public service. We also have a clear position that democratic control over the sector is an essential part of a publicly owned energy system. And we see this as critical in advancing justice in the transition to cleaner energy. So after a decade of research, the TUID analysis is probably sharper than ever. And it's clear to us that a public pathway is needed for an energy transition to both meet ecological and human needs. Um, we're not gonna go into the to it analysis tonight, but um, we will share at the end, um, some of the upcoming events we'll have uh, to sort of workshop the basics of the to it analysis. So more people can have access to and learn about it. Um, so how to it came about uh, was 10 and a half years ago in June 2012 at the Rio Plus 20 UN Climate Summit. Unions from the global south were demanding an alternative to the quote unquote green growth model. And that's a model of economic growth that is supposedly also environmentally sustainable. This model is promoted by institutions like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the World Economic Forum. So later that year in October, 2012, Sean Sweeney, who was at the Rio Plus 20 talks, organized a meeting in New York City with some of the same Global South unions and some progressive Global North unions to discuss these issues. From those discussions, they, degree, they agreed to start the 2ED network to develop an alternative narrative to the green growth model. <clears throat> So for those of you who know Sean, he's the director of the International Program for Labor, Climate and Environment at SLU and also the coordinator of 2ED. So fast forward to 2021 at COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. While we were in COP26, uh, 2ED met with Global South Unions in the network. And in that meeting, we agreed that a 2ED South 
platform was really necessary to develop a public pathway alternative uh, that also addressed the specific issues of energy transition in the global south, such as energy poverty, among other issues. Uh, so then we decided in October 20, uh, 2022, last year, we would organize a meeting in Nairobi, Kenya, and we brought together trade, 70 trade unionists discussing the need for this public pathway approach to energy transition in the global south and the importance of forming a TUA south platform for that purpose. So the SLU travel scholarship was for the Nairobi meeting last October. We had a lot of strong applicants for the scholarship. Um, and the scholarship was originally intended for one person, but in the end, for various reasons, but including because we couldn't decide, we decided to have two students um, be the recipients of the travel scholarship. Um, and in the process of reading applications and interviewing, we realized that this process was um, for the travel scholarship was really just one opportunity for students to engage with TUID and that there were many other ways for engagement um, and that the scholarship was a way that we ended up connecting with a lot of uh, great students um, and, and communicated with them about continuing to connect with them and work with them potentially, um, even if they weren't gonna be uh, on the travel scholarship. So um, that's been a, a fantastic connection and a, a good start to um, engaging with students at SLU. So uh, enough about um, the background of TUED, let's turn to the students and the alum who are actually in Nairobi so we can hear directly from them about their experience. <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna have, uh, I'm, I'll ask some questions and then uh, each of the students will um, respond to them and uh, we'll sort of go through the evening that way. Um, we'll also see a little video clip of the meeting and um, we'll, we'll close out with some opportunities to uh, work with TUED. Um, so first of all, um, let's start with um, just basically tell us a little bit about yourselves um, and why uh, you applied to the SLU Travel Scholarship. I think we'll start with um, maybe Anna and then Andrew, and then we'll hear from Lala. So over to you, Anna. Sure, yeah, I, I couldn't believe it when I first saw that email announcing the SLU Travel Scholarship because it was this very rare instance of three of my like deepest interests coming together, which was like environment, labor, and like justice for developing countries. Mm -hmm. And I had been introduced to TUED through labor notes at one of the climate panels where Irene was speaking. So it all seemed very serendipitous. Um, I work in a climate think tank at NYU Law, which diverges significantly from the TUED analysis. And so coming to TUED was like very stimulating um, because it actually, TUED actually challenged like the underlying ownership structure of energy and like how the profit model was so wasteful of social capital. Um, and so I applied basically, that's how I uh, arrived at TUED. Um, and yeah, it was just a really incredible learning opportunity and I'm sure we'll speak more about that and that's why I'm still here. Great, thanks Anna. Andrew, you wanna jump in? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. And I'm so glad that there's lots of interest um, in TUED's work. Um, uh, yeah, go out and make propaganda for us. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically, I'm a, a you know, master's labor study student. Um, I'm doing my capstone um, this spring and will be done in May. You know, climate work has been really core to my personal organizing and professional work since, you know, since I was, you know, in high school. Um, I got an undergrad degree in environmental humanities and anthropology and studied like my thesis was on the political dimensions of, you know, reactionary and emancipatory political dimensions of climate anxiety. So I don't know if I actually stand by that piece anymore, but um, I went on, I was a farm worker, um, then I had an organic farm business in the Hudson Valley. These were all expressions of my commitment to, um, you know, environmental ethic and my commitment to a climate politics. 
Um, I left that, you know, after having kind of failed to secure affordable land in the Hudson Valley and being really bad at being a small business owner and not enjoying it. Um, and I went back to organizing and have mostly worked in the environmental organizing world. Sorry about the sound. My wife is um, fostering some puppies right now. So um, I um, have mostly worked in infrastructure fights. So fighting um, new fracked gas power plants um, in New York state. And um, while I was at the org that I was at, you know, working on this fracked gas, gas campaign, um, uh, there was a campaign to unionize staff at the org. I was totally union radicalized at this point. Um, we actually successful, we were successful in our campaign, but it was sort of at this moment that I decided to um, go back to school and go to SLU. Um, and it's also at this moment that I really started to think critically about, I think like the left, the center left and the left vision of a decarbonization project um, and about how the organizing that I was doing, you know, was sort of watching, you know, these consistent and sort of snowballing failures of the private energy system to uh, meet their climate targets, right? Like the climate targets laid out in New York state's law, like the CLCPA, um, as well as this kind of whack-a-mole nature of fighting fossil fuel infrastructure without including, you know, democracy, without including democratic ownership, nationalization, and, and, and really like managed centrally planned phase out in any of our policy. Um, so, you know, when I went to SLU, I, you know, I've been mostly focusing on, on the ins and outs of the labor movement and labor history, but um, I wrote a piece for the New Labor Forum on, you know, connecting um, immigration up with, you know, immigration, immigration reform up with uh, the Green New Deal. And um, Paula actually um, sent me along um, the application for this, um, to Ed scholarship. And it's funny because when I when I first showed up at SLU, you know, I had seen to Ed as associated with SLU, I've been really excited about the project. Truthfully, I had no idea how to connect at that time. I I, I knew um, you know, I had seen Sean's some, some of Sean's papers in New Labor Forum. Um, but I thought maybe he would show up and teach a class at some point. Alas, he never did in my time. But um, so this was an amazing opportunity to sort of dig deeper into to Ed's work. Um, and I was, you know, pleasantly surprised that I got picked and I was able to 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 go to Nairobi. And um, you know, I, you know, with the help with the, in consultation with 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 folks at Two Ed and and sort of. Um, you know, I've been I've been working on a, a capstone project that um, is specifically looking at um, public ownership, but um, public ownership here in the United States. So, and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But yeah, that's sort of my general, um, you know, how, how I found my way to Two Ed and how I find found my way to SLU. So, thanks. Thanks for that, Andrew. Great. Um, Lala. Um, so Lala, you're sort of in a different boat. You didn't uh, apply for the um, scholarship. You were actually um, already connected to, to Ed um, and you were hired as staff uh, around the time that we were um, gonna head out to Nairobi. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself and also um, how did you learn about to Ed um, uh, when you did and sort of what interested you in working with to Ed volunteering and, and whatnot? Uh, yeah, it's it's great to be here. So I was a undergraduate student at SLU. And I think what drew me to SLU in the first place was the um, progressive labor oriented education. Um, I knew that I was interested in in labor, internationalism, and you know, sort of a, a left economic politics. And um, I had professors at SLU sort of read, I guess, my work or, or see the, the assignments that I was turning in um, and recommend that I reach out to Sean and Irene um, because of, of my interests. And I think I was intimidated the first time um, a professor recommended this, but by the second or third time, um, I knew that I had to reach out to Tuad. 
So I wrote, I believe it was Sean, an email um, introducing myself saying, you know, I, um, I would love to work on your Latin America organizing if there's an opportunity for that. Uh, but more than anything, I just want to learn from you. This is such a, a cool program. I'm a student at SLU. Um, can I help in any way? And Sean and Irene um, and, and also John at the time were extremely welcoming. Um, it was really nice to find that at SLU because we, you know, we go to get an education, but um, the most fulfilling part of any education is being able to implement what we're learning in courses into a project, um, and especially a project that has international reach, which I think is more or less rare in um, US-based universities, and um, in a way that sort of doesn't, you know, tokenize international work, but has decades long relationships with comrades um, in different sectors, including but beyond energy. So uh, I started volunteering at TUED uh, first, I think doing translations and interpretation, Spanish, English. Um, and every time I went to a meeting, I just, I, my mind was was blown. And that's, I mean, that's the reality. It, it was so um, world expanding uh, to hear an analysis that for, you know, very, structural reasons isn't uh, common, isn't heard commonly in the NGOs um, and in other places where I had worked. Um, and, you know, one of the questions that I kept coming up against was, how does this project get funded? How does a project this, this beautiful, this real, this, um, you know, radical in its, in its vision of, of the future um, get funded? And I think, the the partnership with with SLU um, is part of that, and then also just back to the you know the the this like long term trust building um, with with unions and and being funded by the unions themselves. Um, but just to wrap up, I my my background before coming to SLU was in agrarian trade unions in Colombia, back home where I'm from, um, and. You know, um, we'll we'll get into this more, but I think that the the work that Tuad is doing now around Tuad South is is so important. I remember when I worked with the agrarian trade unions um, around issues of um, food sovereignty and land reform. You know, the the terms and topics of environmental justice and climate justice and climate change. Those weren't terms that I was hearing often, um, but obviously they were, you know, part of uh, what we were fighting for at the time. Um, and I think the point being that often environmental questions and climate justice questions go through the sort of structural pillars of ownership, of who ultimately makes decisions in our economies, in the global market. Um, and I think that, anyway, it, 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 you know, the fact that TUED um, looks those face on speaks to the, you know, the the land reform work that, that I was interested in Colombia. Yep, um, back over to you, Irene. Great, thank you, Lala. That was that was great to hear. Um, uh, Anna, I just want to go back to you really quickly. Um, just, do you want to say anything about your international background? Um, just uh, personally, professionally, your interests, etc. Uh, sure. Um, so I am a Georgian American, uh, and I kind of grew up in a lot of different countries. So I was very interested in not just you know how does responding to climate change look like for wealthy developed countries but how does it look like for less wealthy countries um and so that's why it was so incredible to find to it and also their attempt to expand their analysis to actually respond to the circumstances in the global south 
um, in terms of why labor? Um, well, I was a worker. Um, I still am, but that, that transition from university to work kind of radicalized me on how horrible working is. So that helped. And also some, you know, theoretical stuff about the levers of power in the working class. So that's why I am also an organizer in my workplace. Um, and that's why I'm at SLU. And so that's why it was so exciting to kind of see all three of these interests coming together in the two ed project and why I'm so motivated to like volunteer my time and do research to kind of further this project. Irene, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that was excellent. Um, well, I just want to say, as you can see, why we had trouble selecting between, you know, between these two, um, and already there was other uh, applicants that were also um, quite excellent. And you can just hear from um, what all three of these um, current SLU students and uh, alumni have shared um, the depth of um, an interest in not just uh, working on climate issues, but trying to think about um, issues of transformation that need to take place um, in order to both meet climate targets, but also um, to think about societal change towards uh, uh, a better world that we all want. Um, so thanks for that first set of answers, everybody. Um, we're gonna move on to the next question, which is more sort of focused on Nairobi specifically and your experience there at the launch of Two Ed South. Um, what were some of the highlights you gained or insights maybe you gained um, from your experience there at the meeting? And what were some of the key things um, you learned from being there with everybody? So we can go in the same order if that works. Yeah, okay. Sure. Um, yeah, so the first thing I would say is like what an incredible and unbelievable opportunity it was to be in a room with like 70 trade union representatives from different countries throughout Africa, also Latin America and some Asian countries, and also, as Irene mentioned, some global North allies, but primarily from Africa. I can't imagine like any other circumstances under which we would have ended up in the same room if not for Tuid. So that's obviously a very exciting kind of place to form policy ideas. Um, in terms of the content and sort of what I learned, um, I think we've touched on the fact that TUED takes on the ownership question head on and places it at the center of uh, energy policy discussions, which is quite rare in my experience. Um, I work in more of a centrist think tank and there is just like, oh, like, yeah, of course the private sector is running the show and maybe we can do some regulation or something that would allow the private sector components that we like to profit without being too expensive, but not really like, is this whole thing actually a waste of taxpayers' money? And so that part was very exciting and learning about kind of, um, basically to a, the two analysis contextualized how, um, much of the climate policy solutions that are being presented in the mainstream are actually just feeding into this private profiteering. And an example of this is like the um, guaranteed in uh, the guaranteed profits that utilities need to have for some inexplicable reason that then just is charged to the consumers or like the idea that if we can incentivize, I guarantee profit for, you know, different kinds of, um, renewable generation or transmission or something that we need um that like that is the best way to transform the, like to go about the energy transition uh when in reality to ed kind of shows how this is just like privatizing public money uh and so when you look at things like the inflation reduction act through this lens you it kind of cuts through this celebratory rhetoric that the mainstream media presents around it and that many of the environmental ngos including my own kind of present about this and i think what was so interesting about the conference is that quite unlike the us mainstream the trade union leaders in at in the conference from the global south seem to be in very broad agreement that like further privatization was not the answer. And so that was like an incredible starting point for that conversation. Um, I think another big takeaway 
uh, another way that Tua sort of cuts through the celebratory self-serving rhetoric of, you know, mainstream environmental movements and their corporate allies is by reframing the energy transition narrative as an energy expansion narrative. So like, you'll see everywhere in the media, like energy transition, this, that, you know, but actually, if you look at the expansion and the investment in energy, yeah, there's, it's, it's actually more of an energy expansion where like fossil fuel energy is growing and renewable energy is growing. And it's not that renewable energy is replacing the fossil fuel energy. And I think you can also see that in like the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, for example, right? So this, I, this, um, I just like cutting through a lot of the celebratory rhetoric is how I would describe like the biggest contribution um, of the two-ed analysis. Great, thank you, Anna. Um, and again, we are going to have a couple of events coming up um, where we'll go more in depth into the two-ed analysis, the basics of, um, and so folks can um, feel free to join us. Then we'll we'll talk more about that later. Um, but why don't we hear from you, Andrew? Yeah, thanks. Um, I, it's funny. I um, you know it's many many months now since um, since we went. So some of the like my <laughs> My uh, I, I have my my impressions are are sort of more impressions than insight than they are very very concrete um, stories any longer. But yeah, and I feel like I'm going to echo a lot of the things that Anna said so eloquently because um, they were things that definitely struck me and sort of just honestly from a sort of a from the North American trade union and North American environmental movement context, um, they were so striking that it literally felt as uh, as if I was you know. Uh, you know, I, it was like we were operating on a different emotional register um, than the way we talk about environmental politics here um, in the U.S. And it was like refreshing to the point of like being very hopeful. And I, I rarely feel political hope. I mean, it's been at least maybe since the, I don't know, 2016 Bernie, um, <laughs> since I felt the degree of hope that I felt in Nairobi. And it was so amazing to just be surrounded by so many comrades who are actively in struggle, um, you know, fighting privatization, uh, conceptualizing a future that is pro-public, a future that meets their actual needs, both, uh, you know, nationally and re regionally, and then ultimately within the context of the global south, which is, at least from an energy pr perspective, I think fundamentally at odds with what is um, going on in the global north. And um, to name that and to admit that, um, I think is, an, is, is, is honestly an important thing. But yeah, so having, you know, been in the climate movement um, and, um, you know, being swimming in kind of their strategic and even epistemological presumptions, um, you know, I, I came in with these, you know, with these things like climate change is very, very real. And the and the green growth private sector model isn't great, right? I'm a democratic socialist. I don't believe it's great, but it can solve it. And ultimately, maybe it's all we've got. And I think you have to go pretty far to the left, like you know, in the U.S. to find an org that doesn't, you know, support you know, what Anna was talking about: public money going to private subsidies, you know, so public to private partnerships to build renewables, right? That's that's how we do it. At two ed, I think both of those assumptions, one about climate change and the other about decarbonization, um, excuse me, about um, green growth were questioned. You know, I had a number of really interesting conversations with folks, you know, in breakout groups where they were like, you know, questioning this or that climate science claim. And they weren't bad conversations. Like, Nobody was out and out denying climate change is real, but they were conversations that you'd never have today in the North American trade union or environmental movement context. It was really interesting. Many folks I talked to thought, you know, putting climate front and center, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about the climate crisis, you know, was putting the cart before the horse because it wasn't meeting the or speaking to the material reality of the energy context on the ground in the global south. On the other hand, you know, you have this sort of felt and kind of documented as seen in everyone's speeches and in reports, you know, this documented negative experience of the privatization of the energy and electricity sector, you know, especially as this kind of continued colonial relationship, imperial core periphery relationship of debt and exploitation and structural reforms, what we'd probably like now call like green colonialism. 
Um, and that was present in like every conversation. And so the strategic, and again, this is kind of Anna's point, the strategic disagreements aside of which there were many, like to lots and lots, um, a pro-public pathway to decarbonization and public ownership and democratic control were seen as like vital as necessary interventions in the climate fight. And more specifically in sort of the rapid and equitable alleviation of energy poverty through programs like, you know, uh, mass rural electrification. Um, because, you know, green assistance from Europe, from um, the World Bank and the IMF meant more debt for the countries of the South. That concessional financing meant, you know, a series of reforms that add up to additional privatization of public energy systems. And yeah, I mean, having grown up in the North American context, you know, we all mostly forget, maybe not us, but, you know, who actually implemented the task of mass rural electrification, you know, where we have kind of this accepted, um, you know, kind of resigned sense that like of, of capitalist, neoliberal capitalist realism, which renders these types of conversations like, you know, non-existent, obsolete. Um, and if they are talked about in uh, sort of a, you know, a policy outfit, like the one that Anna works for or an environmental policy org like the one I work for, they're seen as silly um, or impossible. And yeah, so I found I found that really hopeful. I'm looking if I have any other. Um, I was really interested um, to see a number, people were willing to discuss a number of spicy topics, you know, that were on the table in Nairobi, like particularly things about, like even thinking about non-alignment and a willingness to sort of, a, or a willingness interest, desire, lack of interest to allow cautious and strategic alignment, you know, towards with China as a source of finance and development and green infrastructure in and against the West. I thought that was really interesting, um, as well as to consider and think seriously about the, you know, reality of mining and extraction associated with green decarbonization. And yeah, I mean, even like building like real regional, like, let's say like Pan-African, you know, economic and political power through, um, through like a cartel strategy, right? The future use of like a rare earth mineral cartel strategy, which would flip that kind of economic relationship of, of green growth to potentially favor the global South countries over the global North, um, you know, cons considering their dependence on minerals for hitting their climate targets and perpetuating the green growth model. So, um, I have plenty of other things to say, but it was really, really amazing. I was, I felt completely undeserving um, being there. I felt kind of silly, but in some ways that's sort of interesting because then, you know, you show up as a, you, 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 yeah, people were willing to like be pretty straight with me as kind of like this one random white guy student in the room. Um, yeah, so bringing this whole framework home, you know, celebrating that the, the sort of struggles like local and regional of all these trade union, 70 trade union comrades. Um, it's really helped helped me, you know, kind of begin to interrogate my own organizing. And um, yeah, 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 yeah. Great, thank you, Andrew, for that. Um, all right, let's go over to Lala. Um, all right, so to add on to Anna and Andrew's great comments, I think, you know, it's it's important to highlight that the most arguably, at least, the most important work happened before the conference, because once again, it's about those um, long-term relationships and the trust building that Tuit has done over a decade um, of knowing, you know, who to ask for, uh, what recommendation, in what country. Most Tuit unions prior to Nairobi uh, were from Latin America, United States, Europe, and some from East Asia. Uh, there weren't that many from from Africa, and so I think it was, you know, a challenge that uh, Sean and Irene really rose to to reach out to these comrades and um, to start with like a network and solid relationships of like a core group of you know longstanding to it. Uh, participants that could make those recommendations. So just, you know, it starts with who were these 70 people? Um, because as we know, uh, you know, the trade union movement obviously isn't immune to um, a neoliberal ideology. And this is something that Tuet has written about in its papers. 
um, you know, of the perils of a social dialogue approach. And um, so the people in the room were, um, had already sort of come from, you know, these, this network of, of, of trust, of public power, of uh, central planning. Um, and then we had done trainings on the two ed uh, analysis prior. And so once we were in Nairobi, it, it wasn't the beginning, right? It was like the product of these longstanding relationships and analyses and political education. Um, and then, um, you know, I think to highlight that the analysis that two ed has is marginal in the groups that get financed, but the ideology and the ideas of it are not marginal, right? These are extremely popular ideas because as any union and any country that has undergone green structural adjustment and the prior structural adjustment programs will know these are catastrophic um, and have been slowly uh, carving at the state's capacity to plan, to um, execute, to be sovereign, to make long-term decisions about what is right and best for its people. And so these ideas are not marginal. I think that was like, you know, something really that stood out from this, um, from this conference, but it's a matter of how do we act as regional blocks? How do we act as global South together in coordination with our analysis, understanding these as patterns, as trends? Um, I mean, a lot of this, uh, the wording that comes from consulting groups, from the World Bank, from the IMF, from um, the multilateral uh, development banks, um, these, you know, the language doesn't vary too much uh, chapter to chapter, agreement to agreement, uh, there are a lot of, co of common enemies. And yet, because of the technical challenges of each um, country's and each region's uh, sort of, you know, how much oil they have, what their energy matrix is, what their uh, financial sort of debt and sovereign situation is, they the solution does often look a little bit different. And so it's identifying how we can work together. And I think, you know, one of the most interesting par parts were the breakout groups, because, um, for example, I was uh, sitting with uh, comrades from uh, Mozambique and then also from Latin America, from Argentina, Uruguay, Mexico uh, and uh, Brazil. And just to, again, to see the common ground, but more than that, to think about how can we leave this uh, conference with a plan? And so that was, I think, what stood out to me, the outcomes document that came out of this conference. Um, and already, you know, in, in May, we're going to have a regional follow-up meeting um, in, in Johannesburg to talk about uh, policy. There's an advisory group of Tuad South in the making. Um, there's a research network, or like the early discussions of a research network in Latin America that came out of the outcomes document, um, and then regional meetings. So uh, in in Asia Pacific and Latin America, there, unlike many conferences, there were concrete, yeah, grounded um, sort of outcomes and goals that that came out of it. Um, and so I think. I think that that was what stood out to me. Great, thank you so much, um, Lala and Andrew and Anna for your reflections and um, really highlighting some critical pieces um, of things, both in terms of depth of content and sort of like the culture of the experience there, as well as um, sort of to its role in, um, in how these things uh, took shape. Um, uh, I'll just add that, um, you know, when we decided to, to try um, launching a two-ed South platform, um, the vision was that, well, either it was going to flop in Nairobi or um, something was going to come out of this. And um, I think where our hope was that this would be a multi-year project um, with a vision to kind of grow um, 
and that you know that there was going to be a lot of work that would need to take place in individual regions and then cross regionally. And I think, um, as you just heard from these three, that there was um, a lot of richness in terms of the conversation, but that this was just the very beginning, and there's so much more that needs to happen. But I think we we created the grounds for a good um, launching. And um, we could see the enthusiasm of the participants there to keep going and um, to carry forward. And all already, as Lala just mentioned, there are things in the works right now um, to move forward. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I will also say, because um, it was mentioned earlier that there was some non-alignment. Um, I mean, there was lots of sort of, I think, nuances of things where things are not aligned. Um, there are overall places where a lot of alignment happened, but there was also some tension in some of the big alignment places. And so um, we want to create the conditions for those kinds of debates and tensions to emerge and um, talk through them and figure out uh, how to move forward. Um, and, uh, and so I think we were able to um, also have some of that there, which I think is, is a good sign um, of of, um, as you were saying, Lala, like relationship building, long-term relationships that we've had and um, the sort of the um, uh, willingness to continue engaging in, in depth in relationships. Um, so that was all very exciting. Um, okay, I think now we're gonna move to um, see uh, six minutes of a 14 minute video um, that Lala made of the um, Tuad South launch in Nairobi. And uh, it's quite a fantastic video. So we'll put the link in at the end so everybody can um, watch the whole thing if you want um, uh, at your own leisure. But um, we'll just capture the first uh, six minutes or so today. So. Amanda! Amanda! Viva Tuad Viva! Tuad is a growing global network of unions working to advance democratic control and social ownership of energy in ways that promote solutions to the climate crisis, address energy poverty, and resist the degradation of both land and people. In late 2022, 70 trade union leaders from seven national centers, 24 trade unions, and three global union federations, all together representing 27 countries, gathered in Nairobi, Kenya for the launch of Tuad South. Tuad South is a new trade union platform focused on energy transition, climate policy, and broader issues of environment and worker-led options for low carbon development. Participants in Nairobi committed to further a public pathway approach to energy transition in ways that can address major challenges confronting the Global South. Among them, rising levels of fossil fuel extraction and use, as well as high levels of energy poverty. The meeting had three objectives. One, create a platform for trade union cooperation on issues of energy transition, climate protection, and sustainability. Two, build general agreement around a clear facts-based analysis of current realities and identify challenges. And three, commit to developing a public pathway alternative anchored in the defense and expansion of public ownership of energy systems and essential supply chains. What is the public pathway? an approach to a transition to a low carbon energy system, including restoration of full public ownership of energy, including essential supply chains, long-term energy planning of an economy-wide and cooperative approach to decarbonization, a public goods mandate for reclaimed and existing state-owned utilities, decommodification, ending energy for profit and pivoting towards energy conservation and efficiency. Democratic control, meaning popular participation at all levels. Technological pluralism based on facts and rigorous research and development. And public financing, using capital to rebuild state assets and capacities. We need to propose alternatives. One part of 
what we're doing is resisting the second part is where do we want to go and that's why these meetings are so important because it's where we want to go has to be shaped by the realities we have in our countries but also in our regions and more broadly in the global south thinking of that alternative thinking of what we call this public pathway in very concrete terms as well as in broader terms is very very important in order to challenge this green structural adjustment and I think what we're doing here is going to feed back to those struggles that we have locally. Public-private partnership really do not work in the interest of the people, especially when it comes to provision of public services and goods. So I want to agree with my comrades who noted that uh, for us as Public Service International, we don't encourage issues of privatization or private, uh, privateers coming into provision of public services. What do you mean by green growth? Why are we actually opposing the word green growth? What is green structural adjustments? How do they actually relate to the former uh, structural adjustment programs? This gives us that leverage to be able to adequately engage with our policymakers. En fait, les PPP, c'est une forme de privatisation déguisée. Des fois, il faut clarifier ces notions-là. C'est quoi le PPP? Le PPP, c'est de réduire artificiellement la, la, la dette publique. Et donc, la réalisation, euh, la, la conception, réalisation et gestion, c'est confié au secteur privé. Et je pense que nous devons, en tant que travailleurs, en tant que citoyens et en tant que communautés, commencer à discuter comment nous développer un framework dans lequel nous pouvons mettre ou nous pouvons situer le public que nous parlons. En réponse, le réponse KPT a adopté la demande pour une politique centrée de la transition and has focused on building a solidarity within and outside the union for climate response and has been discussing ways to promote international solidarity with KCTU. As it is predictable that renewable energy will replace coal power which has been operated in the public sector, privatization of renewable energy in collaboration between the government and large private companies is taking center of debate in the energy sector in Korea. In response to this, KPTU is demanding integration of six divided public power generation corporations into one public energy corporation in order to expand public-centered renewable energy. What is the best pathway that we need? We need, uh, as indicated, we need to integrate the regions. The regional energy policies must be brought together so that they can take into account the sustainable technologies. We have discussed about the various and shortfall. We also need to use the power pools, East African power pool, South African power pool, Central Africa, and the rest. We also need to, to focus as unions in using the economic blocks that are there. The East African community, COMESA, SADC, and ECOWAS, in order to be able to leverage and advocate for, for a clear public pathway we can have examples of public owned utilities which are properly governed and they are able to deliver on their mandate. If we plan to industrialize, if we plan to have oh. all right. Sorry to cut that short, but just because of time, we're not going to uh, watch the entire video. Um, but I'll leave you at that cliffhanger um, and hopefully you can watch it on your own. Um, the rest of it is also pretty excellent and uh, ends with a bang. So um, you can look forward to that. And that was, um, again, that was Lala's handiwork um, with uh, putting that video together. Um, so let's see, let's go back to the last question. Um, I think we're gonna end with, is just uh, hearing from all of you about you know how this how this um, meeting or participating in the travel scholarship uh, has impacted your work at SLU, um, your life in general, or has it? Um, and uh, I know you've already spoke some to some of those things, but um, maybe there's some other things to add. Um, and in particular, I know. Uh, Anna and Andrew, you're working on capstones that have some um, relevance, and then uh, we'll hear about some of Lala's work. So over to you. Do you want to start, Anna? Um, sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so how it's impacted me? Well, um, right now I'm working on a capstone to 
try to answer a piece of the questions uh, around um, to ed's analysis. So obviously there's a lot of countries. The framing document for the conference wasn't able to dive into the energy situations of all of them. Uh, so my capstone is looking at the uh, history of privatization in the Indian power sector and the role of trade unions in combating it. So uh, we're, you know, negotiating the design of the project to uh, be something that can serve to it. And this is, you know, an example of a way that you might get involved if you'd like to help with research. Um, on a broader level, the way that my involvement with Tuet has shaped my life is, uh, I guess it can be summarized in um, something that Sean said, which has stuck in my head for a long time. He said, where are the leftist energy lawyers? And I just thought that that was a very good question. <laughs> so it, it very much motivated me to try to understand like the trillion complexities of actually running a power grid that like all of our private sector enemies understand. So that's something that I'm working on uh, and that I plan to work on now when I go to law school next year. Great, thank you. Yes, we look forward to you being that, leading the charge of the left lawyers on energy policy. So thank you for doing that, Anna. <laughs> Over to you, Andrew. That's amazing. I love that, Anna. Um, yeah, please, thank you for doing that. No, I really think, I mean, I think electricity, um, the electricity sector and socialist politics is on, on the ascendance. Um, and so, yeah, I think, but I do think that you're totally right um, that both there's, there is so much legal expertise required, but then there's also, yeah, you know, these sort of deep technical engineering infrastructural questions that um, both you know, folks who are profiteering off the energy sector already know back and forth, or at least know the people who know that. But even there is like this large sort of middle, um, you know, folks who I would say, um, in terms of political valence, you know, would be seen sort of neutrally, um, a lot of them unionized, you know, working in the utility sector, who really do have, you know, these, um, you know, technical skills, who understand uh, how electricity moves through the grid, who understand the difference between high, you know, high power transmission wire and distribution lines and um, all these types of things. And I do think the left and, and the and the center, specifically the climate center, has has very hazy understanding of how that works. So, um, yeah, for me, I mean, I think it's completely reoriented the equation in my head about kind of the decarbonization project, which I think I've I've had backwards for a long time. And you know, I'm I'm in the global north, so I think to some degree it's um, yeah, that's how ideology works. But um, yeah, I mean, just that that basically like you know, definitely in the global south and more of the global north than I think we're willing to admit if anyone's ever like tried to access clean water or clean electricity in large parts of the US, like the wholesale alleviation of energy poverty, you know, which is basically down the line from poverty itself and the development of an industrial base, you know, um, particularly in the global south, this was something that was talked about a lot, an industrial base that serves community needs that creates good durable jobs and, and breaks that you know, core periphery relationship, also build sovereignty, um, you know, you know, won't ever happen under neoliberal green growth. And, but on the other hand, climate change, you know, we could, we can imagine climate change being solved under green growth. And so we have to lead with the first thing. And so that is now the thing that kind of rings in my head, how I translate it into my professional work as you know, someone working in environmental policy in New York, it's not totally clear to me yet. I, I've certainly talked to, um, I, you know, I hope to continue to engage with Tued, and I've talked to Irene about, you know, this sort of future possibility of an, of an organizing program in the United States about, um, there are some groups that are, again, again, beginning to cohere around this idea about nationalization, not only of the uh, electrical utility sector, but of the energy system, you know, broadly, including the nationalization of um, uh, like of oil companies and things like this. You've seen probably lots and lots of articles about this um, in the last couple of years. So um, 
And then, yeah, just to finish quickly, you know, I'm writing Capstone 2 that probably doesn't serve 2Ed's needs other than is maybe interesting to them, but um, it has to do with the um, public power campaign here in New York, which is the group of energy, democracy, and socialist, and some labor union advocates in a coalition, um, you know, working to pass a bill called the Build Public Renewables Act, as well as there were some other public power bills. Um, the bill's been snaking its way through the Senate and Assembly in New York for the last couple of years. It's actually a, a, a component of it was included in the governor's budget a couple of weeks ago, um, although not any of the labor friendly language, um, which is, uh, I think, the most impressive part about the bill. It's considered some of the most labor friendly language of any New York bill ever written. Um, but my project is kind of looking at the nuances of why actually um, the coalition has in some ways, you know, failed to garner the support of utility sector unions and whether, you know, what are the reasons for the lack of support? Um, are they minor, you know, disagreements over legislative language or the, you know, inclusion or non-inclusion of certain energy technologies like, like nuclear or, or do they, do they, you know, um, indicate like a more fundamental um, opposition between utility sector unions um, here in New York and in the United States against a public pathway. Um, so I'm digging into that now. If anyone is working on that project or knows anyone who is, I'm doing lots and lots of um, interviews. Um, so please hit me up. That's awesome, Andrew. And um, yeah, there's, as you can see, there are so many things that um, can be done in relationship to TUED. And um, Andrew, we're looking forward to you spearheading the campaign nationally for public ownership or renationalization of the grids or not renational, but nationalization of the grids. Um, but yeah, I mean, the New York campaign, it's in our backyard, right? Because we're based here. Um, but uh, we just don't have the bandwidth to really go in deep. So we've done some work um, with the public renewables uh, campaign, but just not nearly enough. So it's it's fantastic that you're working on that um, and that we can connect around uh, the issues right here in New York. Um, okay, over to you, Lala. Um, well, we already saw some of your handiwork, um, but there's so many things that you're working on now and uh, maybe you can share some of those things off of Nairobi. Uh, sure, I'll be brief, um, and I'll end actually where I started, which is that uh, both, you know, the CUNY SLU education and the two ed program, primarily what they allow is the ability to um, to think critically about the questions that are shaping our world today. And like, maybe that sounds potentially cheesy, but you know, in Colombia, we have, um, and this this is actually a really similar response to to Andrews. Um, in Colombia, we have our first left government, our first progressive government um, in the country's history, and I've been um, been living there. I'm now based there, um, and you know, to be able to participate in meetings with that the ministry and the trade unions have been organizing around uh, just transition debates and to be able to use the slew education and the tools that Tuat has given me to critically engage in, in those conversations to intervene to say well we're not we're missing this part of the equation has been so fulfilling um it you know it, it makes me think that if if Tuat could <laughs> have more staff members, more volunteers, more students, um, you know, we could be participating in those extremely relevant conversations in a timely manner when they are happening in those strategic moments, not just in New York, not just in Colombia, but, you know, um, around the world. And there's only so many flights that Irene and Sean can take to be in those discussions. Um, so it's it's really just one of those, you know, uh, it's incredible what 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 Tuet is doing. It's so unique. It uh, speaks to such a sort of niche topic um, uh, approach, but that like gets at the key structural questions. Um, um, and I, you know, I just love to see Tuet grow in um, in in staff um, primarily. 
um, because there's just so much more than we can actually uh, bite and chew. So um, I'll just say that I'll. Sorry, oh, Lalo. Yeah, we lost you for a sec. These are some of the bulletins that have come out from recent trips. Um, to it was in Santiago, Chile, in a conference. Uh, we had, you know, meetings with the trade unions there. Um, it's also a pivotal time. Boric is in power. You know, they just had that um, really um, uh, important, I guess, defeat with the Constitutional Assembly, and now they are reworking. Um, the changes that they wanted to make through that assembly into reforms. And energy is right there in the middle. The question of lithium, of how Boric is going to lead on the national um, lithium company is, and, and how that ties into, for example, Chinese ownership of some of these uh, mines, like that's critical. And then uh, the most recent bulletin published just two, three days ago, is um, on Brazilian unions calls to renationalize the energy sectors. Um, I was there just last year, again, with TUED, meeting with transportation workers, with Group Brazil, with research centers. Um, and it's, it's just so exciting to be, uh, I can mostly speak to the Latin America question, you know, how, how, <laughs> how central energy is to each one of these progressive governments and how powerful it can be to have trade unions knowledgeable, technically pushing um, these progressive administrations on these issues. Um, I'll just close with, with you know, the, the example closest to my heart, and which is, which is Colombia. Um, you know, thanks to, you know, having been around to it for four or five years now, um, and having built these relationships with the Colombian trade unions, um, when Gustavo Petro went to Davis and um, to the um, World Economic Forum conference and said, we will no longer be exploring um, oil in, in Colombia. We are going to finish our current contracts, but not uh, start new exploration. The unions came out and said, you know, we are for a planned transition. We need to reclaim 100% state ownership of Ecopetrol, and we need to use those funds in order to invest in public renewable energy in Colombia in a way that um, respects the uh, democratic um, and, uh, wishes of, of communities um, and that works for Colombia long term and our position in the global market, um, and that works with the uh, with with the regional governments, our brothers and sisters in Latin America, um, so that we can have you know more potentially interconnected um, energy grids in Latin America, uh, learning from the experiences of Europe um, while maintaining and prioritizing our energy sovereignty. So it's just so exciting to have these tools and to be in these in you know i guess um in the in the rooms where these decisions are, are being made and to have something to say i think that's the most rewarding part of um both a slew and uh to ed education and organizing experience thank you lala um and i just want to emphasize that lala has been uh was volunteering with TUED for many years, um, translating, interpreting, um, helping doing outreach in Latin America, interpreting for meetings, um, which furthered relationships that TUED had with Latin American unions. So um, I wanna thank you for that um, and all the years of sort of volunteerism and, and dedication to the project before um, you came on staff. Um, Anna, did you wanna say something? Jump back in. Yeah, I just wanted to really emphasize what Lala said about how much exciting stuff trade unions are doing on energy around the world. It's really hard to imagine this in the US where trade unions do not really do all that much policy intervention on these kind of issues. Um, but like this is, I think, one of the biggest takeaways um, of being involved with the Two at South project of just seeing that, oh, like in India, for example, there's like regular utility worker strikes when things try to get when people try to privatize something and you know 
just the level of influence. They're like a political actor in the energy policy debate so that even the neoliberal people writing their papers about what should happen have to acknowledge that the trade unions are an obstacle to be crushed, right? Which is not the case in the US. So it's very inspiring, I think, to get involved in this project, both for like how, you know, funding a better could help get more involved and support these very important initiatives that trade unions are undertaking with energy around the world, but also for just like bringing this level of vision and ambition to our own unions in the US and like trying to be, you know, as powerful and influential as some of these unions in developing countries are, I think is like really important to take away from the two ed project. Thanks for that, Anna. Um... And uh, I just want to mention, um, it was mentioned briefly, that there is a framing document that we used in preparation for the Nairobi meeting that Sean wrote. Um, and it's sort of it's sort of an ongoing draft because our we're constantly learning and um, and sort of revising. Um, and it was revised again after the um, the Nairobi meeting. And that will go up on our website um, uh, this, sometime this year. And we're, we'll break it down into sections. So it's a little bit more accessible to people um, by sort of like subtopic. Um, but if you're interested in some of these, um, going more in depth into some of these issues, um, please take a look at the, the Nairobi framing document. And also there's a lot of resources on our website, a lot of working papers, um, a lot of our in-depth analysis, uh, an archive backlog of all of the bulletins that have gone out. They're like much shorter, sort of uh, more accessible pieces on what's happening in the world around public energy. Um, and you can learn a lot from, from those um, documents and those uh, archived bulletins. Um, so let's segue into the very last bit, which is really just, um, you know, uplifting this idea of uh, working with 2ED and volunteering. Like, as you heard, there's just so many things that we can be doing. We don't have the capacity, um, as has been mentioned, our ideas, even though I personally think there are rational solutions to the energy transition, many call them radical. So <laughs> I don't know, but, um, but what that means is it does mean that it's hard to fund to, for us to find funding because um, if we're challenging the structures that be in terms of um, capital and um, how uh, the economic the global economic system has functioned for years, then there's not a, you know there no one is like knocking on our door to fund us. So um, we are largely supported by. Um, union contributions and also some by um, Rosa Luxemburg's Diftung, New York's office um, has been a steady um, supporter and SLU. And so um, if you have any leads, please feel free to share with us. But more importantly, um, a lot of us volunteer. I, I volunteered for 2ED for almost a year before I came on staff um, because I had been working in environmental justice, um, in, you know, environmental issues, environmental justice for many years. Um, and in many different jobs. But when I heard Sean speak about public ownership, it all just made sense. And I wanted to know what he understood. And so I volunteered with 2ED for many years. I'm not many, many months, um, but, you know, did things like um, took notes for meetings, um, helped manage some of the, um, the global meetings um, on tech. Um, uh, yeah, just did various things and through that process got to learn the analysis more and more and simultaneously the analysis was getting deeper and deeper and I got to meet um, trade unions and I started to help with outreach and organizing and all that so um, we have put into the chat uh, a form, which is a feedback and volunteer form feedback from tonight's program but also um, just if you are interested, you know, we need research, we need people helping to do Zoom tech for global meetings. Um, we need translators, we need interpreters, um, you know, so many different things. Um, there are people coming to us that want to do events. For example, you know, Andrew was mentioning like a US sort of, you know, energy nationalization or like electrical grid nationalization kind of, um, project. There are people that, um, you know, work in DSA or um, are interested in these ideas and want to 
do a workshop or an event or a conference and we're interested, but we don't have the capacity to do those things all the time. And so um, if these are kinds of things that you'd like to participate in, let us know, we can co connect you and, um, and figure out if there's ways that TUED can you know, work with you on those things. So there's sort of an endless list of ideas um, and we're totally open to ideas as well. So fill out that form and, um, and, and we'll, you know, we'll get back to you um, and hopefully we can maybe have some kind of a, a meeting at some point. Um, and um, one other, oh, right. And that there are, uh, we're going to do a couple of workshops uh, more specifically on the TUIT analysis coming up in June and then July that really goes over the basics. We've touched on them and we've sort of dipped into them here, but we'll walk you step-by-step step, um, through some of the ideas that um, help you understand um, what are the failures of neoliberal energy policies? What are the mechanisms that are not working and why? There was a question about, um, you know, why you know, why would people even think that the green growth model could solve anything? Um, yeah, it's about investment and the the sort of propaganda around how investment will lead the way. And we'll break some of that down so people can have a, a better picture. Um, and we hope by building some of this like knowledge bank, we can, um, you know, get more people understanding the issues and engaged in some ways, whether it's something you start up yourself or um, something that's connected to, to it. But we'll stay in touch with you.